right now, right? No, because Richard's about to start Welcome the show. Welcome so. to the Arts and Antique Radio Show, where your host, nationally recognized certified appraiser Elizabeth Stewart, Santa Barbara's treasure sleuth, will help you put a value on the treasures in your own home. Every time it rains, it rains. You guys get that from static? heaven. Hey, Richard, we're getting a lot of static. Cloud contains honey from heaven. here, stand by. So let's find out. How valuable is it? Three, two, hello, one, hello, hello. you're live. Hello, hello, hello. Santa Barbara, it's your chantress of everything valuable and beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. And I have with me today the California Nature Art Museum and important people to a new show that's up there called The Birds and the Bees and More Pollinators. And it is a cross-media show. I'm really excited to talk about it because it, there's all sorts of different things happening. There's um, biological samples. And of course, we're talking about uh, specimens. And there are some beautiful pieces of art that celebrate birds and the bees and other pollinators, including um, butterflies and bats and birds. How cool is that? Um, and so uh, it features the work of some important um, important artists and photographers. We've got Elizabeth Weber today, uh, who is a photographer whose works, work hangs in the show. And I want to introduce Elizabeth. Um, she's an independent documentary photographer who focuses on ecological issues. And uh, she's actually interested in both sides of the issue, nature's degradation and nature's healing as well. She is passionate about integrating her work into the solutions of the topics on degradation and healing. She's collaborated with conservationists and not-for-profit. She's dedicated to working with people who are creating positive change in the environment. She's got, um, she's got photography up at uh, the Hawaii Wildlife Discovery Center in, on Maui and also the California Nature Art Museum in Solvang. Elizabeth, have you seen the show in Maui? Yeah, I have. Yeah, that's a different project. That's on marine plastic marine debris in the Hawaiian Islands. All right. All right. Excellent. And I have Stacy Adi with me, and uh, she's been the executive director of the California Nature Art Museum and uh, for 14 years. And, and I should say that the California Nature Art Museum was formerly the Wildling Museum. So um, it, it's been renamed, and I want to talk a little bit about why that is the case. Uh, Stacy's been with the museum for 14 years, and before that, she worked at the museum on the Catalina Island Museum of Art and History for 18 years. She has a master's in museum studies from Cooperstown Graduate Program and a bachelor's in anthropology. She's current, in her current position, she's curated and organized 60-plus exhibitions that use art to inspire a love of nature and their visitors and community. Um, she embraces collaboration with other like-minded organizations. She's delighted to be able to educate general audiences about topics like climate change and the importance of pollinators through creative exhibits and programs. And just to um, let you know that this is also a collaboration with the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration. And that's a, we've got a graduate uh, student with us, a PhD candidate with us to talk a little bit about the um, the collaboration part uh, from the Cheadle Center. And I have Madeline Ostwald, postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's working on the Big B Project at the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration. She's interested in interactions between sociality and the environment and uses behavioral, psychological, and computational techniques in the field and in the lab to understand how and why living evolves and what that means is how, how group living evolves and how social organisms might fare in changing environments. And Madeline, I have to say, I'm super proud of you because I... Um, I'm a bee lover myself, and what's interesting is my son, when he was doing his uh, um, graduate work at Duke University, he had a he bought a um, a property big enough that he could raise his bees, and he had a number of hives in the backyard, uh, you know, big these big boxes that kind of stand out, 
quite tall. And uh, when I would visit, he would um, make sure that I was all suited up. So I had my own white, you know, the the whole body suit and the, the helmet. And so I could go and tend the bees myself. And it's so interesting, just the, the the group dynamics around it and how you learn from, you know, being around them. Yeah. So, absolutely. yeah. So you have the same experience, only deeper, I'm sure. Yeah. I, I also fell in love with bees kind of in the same way, being exposed to those hives and, and observing their social behaviors and how they function in a colony is just I think it's really fascinating to us because humans are social creatures too we're not as successful <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's fantastic and and uh, that that you study that and uh, um so yeah I, I want to start the hour though with Stacy um who's the director of the California Nature Art Museum First of all, Stacey, uh, can you tell us that the decision to rename the museum? And then I'd love to, to hear you talk a little bit about how the show came together. And then if you take us on a verbal tour of the show a little bit. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you for having us. And I'm excited to be here. So um, as far as our rename goes, the, the Wilding Museum has been around since uh, 2000. We opened our doors in 2000 in Los Olivos, um, had two homes there, came to Solving in uh, 2013 and opened our doors here. And of course, Solving is a you know big tourist destination with over a million visitors a year. And just in living here and um, kind of observing people and hearing lots of questions uh, about the name Wildling and who who's Mr. Wildling and how much money did he give you? Well, there was no Mr. Wildling and he certainly didn't give us a big endowment. So um, it just made us really uh, aware that it wasn't really connecting well with general visitors. And of course, we want as many general visitors to find us and get engaged with us and get, you know, turned on by the things that we have here as possible. And so we, uh, two almost two years ago, we started talking about renaming and what would that look like? and eventually landed on California Nature Art Museum just so that it was a lot more apparent to again casual people anybody what they're going to see here and what they're going to get and so this is our first year with actually you know living with that name and all the new signage outside and so far I think it's working I feel like people are understanding a little bit more what they're going to get here and I will say you know we love our heritage we actually like the name Wilding in a way and but it's the Wilding Gallery is the first floor. So the pollinator show that we're mostly talking about today is actually in the Wildling Gallery. So I think I think that helps people with the transition. <laughs> yeah, now, so take us a little bit on the, the gestation of the show and then uh, uh, lead us around the show. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we generally work two, maybe even three years out on what the, the especially our larger shows are going to be. And um, pollinators was a topic that it obviously is in the media a lot the last several years. Uh, I think we've all heard about crises with pollinators, particularly with bee populations. Um, and so at that point, you just keep scouting and trying to find art that might fit that topic. And uh at least a year ago, we started talking to, to specific artists. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Weber, who is part of us today um, here, we, uh, I was made aware of her through an exhibition of hers at the Community Environmental Council new hub facility on State Street and uh, was really inspired and went to a, a panel lecture that she and some associates gave. And uh, that was it. We wanted to have her there. And also you've got, a, what's so interesting, a Toronto artist, Ava Roth, she's produced a series of artworks featuring bee-created honeycombs, which she augments with other media. Can you describe the, a piece? Yeah, it, it's fascinating artwork. Um, we found her actually through Instagram. We're always scouting around for artists. So she actually does a certain amount of work. Maybe it's embroidery on a panel and then um, puts it also in a frame that would fit in a honeybee hive. And so, and those frames might have certain 
structures to them to kind of guide the bees to a certain extent. But at the end of the day, the bees do what the bees do. So that's the collaboration between her initial vision for it and then what they also bring to it. So, But then how, how is it displayed? Well, it's actually in a shadow box. So the work itself is sort of in a little frame in a box, actually not little, they're probably almost 20 by 20. Um, but then those are set in a larger glassed in um, shadow box. And uh, they're so all she, she, mm -hmm. So she inserts, let's say, let's say a, a, a two dimensional object, uh, maybe like an embroidery. Mm -hmm. She inserts that into the hive. Right, with structure around it. So the front might have a geometric um, uh, form to it. So one she actually considers like a quilt. One was a checkerboard. Um, they're all really very different. Um, and then, like I said, the bees kind of do what the bees do within that framework. Um, so it, it, they're all very different and very fascinating, and people are loving looking at them. How cool is that? And then you've got my friend Cynthia James, mm -hmm. uh, who yeah, she's showing her work, and um, and Susan McDonald, and uh, yeah. and then Elizabeth Weber, and Elizabeth, mm -hmm. um, she's capturing images of monarch butterflies, um, and then I know that people can plant a certain native species in their yard. It, remind me what that plant is. Um, well, there's uh, many, many plants to plant for monarchs, um, but native nectar plants are really important for them. And then native milkweed is um, the larval host plant for monarch butterflies. And so um, that is really important for them because it's the only plant that they'll lay their egg on. Um, and it's what caterpillars eat, um, but it's important to only plant it um, at least five miles from the coast. So um, those in the solving area, it's a wonderful place um, to plant uh, milkweeds. It, you have to plant it five miles from the coast? Yeah, because when it's close to the coast, it can um, interrupt their migration cycle. Um, and pull them out of the diapause that they're in while they're overwintering. I see. Well, interesting. So, um, I when we get back from the break, I want you to tell us where you where you go to shoot the shoot the butterflies. You know where are the where are the locations you're shooting. I'd love to hear that. Richard's giving us a sign. We got to go to quick break and just a reintroducing. California Nature Art Museum has a show right now, The Birds and the Bees and More Pollinators. It's a show about pollinators. And you'd, you'd be surprised. Uh, bees, butterflies, birds, and bats are included. And lots of different media in which um, they're presenting the idea of the importance of pollinators. The show runs through Labor Day. So um, you get up there to uh, Solvang and take a look at it. This is formerly the Wildling Museum. And I understand from Stacy, the director, that the gallery on the on the ground floor is still the Wildling Gallery in which the show is is hanging. Um, and we talked a little bit about the type of art. I want to talk a little bit to, to Elizabeth when we get back from the break about where she shoots her butterflies. How cool is that? Don't turn that down. Back in a minute. All right, Richard. There's a surprise dog there. <laughs> yeah, I see that's my, my, my little my little boy that keeps him. There he is. <laughs> All right, you're clear. So 
Stacey, it's, it, I it was interested to hear that you uh, have your master's from Cooperstown. Um, that's such a great program. And uh, yeah, I, I, my, um, my master's at USC and I did a, a, a course with a, a gentleman who, who graduated from, from there and then went on and, and took a PhD at, at um, uh, UCSD and he it was so interesting he he took us on like a virtual tour of um I think it was the Mu Museum of Virtual Reality something like this it was a it was so interesting because it really hammered home the fact that as a director for example if you're Stacy you can present something just by uh, the way you hang the show, you can present a viewpoint that is embedded in the show, embedded in your own opinion, and how that can, you know, how how that can um, influence the 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 viewers, you know, the viewers' thought process on on the topic. And I thought that was so interesting. So we, for about a year, we studied various museums and how they. Um, there were there were sort of an, an inherent bias. It was really okay. We're coming back in three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm talking with three talents here. Stacy Adi is here. She's executive director at the California Nature Art Museum. Uh, she's been with what was formerly called the Wilding in uh, Solvang for 14 years. And by the way, Stacy, how did how did the wilding start? It was in 2000 itself, right? How did it how did it begin? Yeah, so a group of local folks in Santa Barbara led by Patty Jackamane, who's an artist in her own right um, and loves nature, um, was inspired by another museum uh, across the country to use art to inspire people to care about nature. So she wanted to do that right here and thought the valley would be a great place to do it as kind of, you know, a launching point to get into Los Padres and the mountains. Um, and so we uh, started in, behind Maddie's Tavern in the Keenan Hartley House. And we were there for, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And then they expanded and moved to a new building um, on the other side of Los Salinas us. Um, and that's how we, you know, got our start. Um, and of course, Los Olivos is famous for all the wine tasting rooms, which are wonderful if you're into wine tasting, but it was a lot of wine tasting. And uh, for us, it just, what the dynamic of a lot of the visitors there wasn't quite what we were reaching for and in terms of, you know, families and lots of kids and getting them engaged. And so uh, when we found the location here in uh, Solvang, we were like, no, this is, this is a, a better space for us to be and also a bigger building which was great. So we grew a lot when we moved here. You know, I've had Patty Jackamane on the program because I've interviewed her in regards to her sculpture garden at her house. Mm. And it was so interesting. I I interviewed her. I had a show uh, that's sort of the high point of COVID in which I was talking with artists who either retreated to their own personal space, where, where whether it be their studio space or you know, in Patty's case, the outdoor sculpture garden that she has and um, their attitude about being sort of segregated. And Patty was, she was so refreshing because she was like, I love the fact people are leaving me alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I get to really work on, you know, my sculpture and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. her her sculpture garden. I, I want to get back to Elizabeth Weber our independent documentary photographer who's focused uh, uh, for this show on the monarch butterflies. So where do you go to shoot them, Elizabeth? Yeah, um, well, I started the project in 2020 when the monarch butterflies, um, their population, there were less than 2,000 counted in the state of California. And so I was um, going to the different overwintering groves up and down our coast, and I wasn't really seeing any. Um, and so I, uh, since then, have um, been photographing at Elwood, um, up at Pismo Beach, and back in my hometown in Bolinas, and in different sites um, along the coast, different gardens, um, and uh, working to um, 
over the years, um, as their numbers have come back, their, their numbers are still in decline and they're still um, really very vulnerable, um, even though their numbers have come back a bit. So really the work is about expressing their vulnerability. And so for this project, I decided to use some alternative process, processes. And um, I so I've been printing on, on vellum paper and using a gold leaf. And um, that paper is uh, uh, really responsive to the environment, just as the monarch is. Um, and then I use the gold leaf really to express my reverence for them. Uh, but really the body of work is a call to action um, as I've seen their decline over the years and, and really hold uh, so many memories of them from the 70s and 80s living here on the coast um, uh, when there were millions of them. So. Yeah. It's this combination of uh, accessing my memories and seeing their loss and then trying to express um, what I'm seeing and connect people uh, through art and uh, to their plight. Right. And so you say the numbers are still dwindling, but they've come up since 2020 from two. I, I can't believe that 2000. In that's all that existed. Uh, what are they now? Do you know, Elizabeth? Uh, yeah, this year the tally was um, just over two hundred and thirty-three thousand in the state. Um, at the Western Monarch Count does the tally each year, and that's actually a great way for people to volunteer. You can uh, join them in their count, which happens. Um, each year in no, around Thanksgiving, they call it the Thanksgiving count. Um, and so the numbers are up, but they don't re represent a population recovery yet. So, right. So there's yeah, so, they're still at a ninety five percent decline of their I see. population from the nineteen eighties. Yeah. I see. So, and I, I, t tell me a little about the scale of your work. Oh, yeah. So, um, well, I, there's different sizes. Um, I've been experimenting with, um, with, you know, creating different sizes and also doing um, close-ups of monarchs and of caterpillars, of the chrysalis, trying to show each stage of the, the life cycle, because not only do they have this incredible migration, that they do each year, but they also have an incredible metamorphosis. So trying to touch into both parts, both of those parts. And, and then also showing them gathering in groups um, in the overwintering groves, um, really trying to show a variety of photos. I get it, how cool is that? You know, Madeline, um... I'm um, speaking to Madeline Ostwald, who's a postdoctoral scholar at the Center, Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration at UCSB. And, um, you know, I had a, a a large, I mean, a huge, I don't know what kind of bee it was. Maybe you could help, but he was, Vic, he <laughs> personified because he was huge, uh, you know, size of a silver dollar and, you know, furry. And I came in the house and, you know, you can hear the the humming, the, the the sound the wings make. So, and so could the dog. And this is a new puppy. And I was thinking, okay, you know, and this, I realized it's a new, it's a new Dachshund, but this little guy has a vertical leap that is incredible. And he was just, just like skyrocketing to, to catch that bee. And it was either going to be he or I was going to catch that bee. So um, I very carefully took a, a, a towel and tried to get the bee, you know, in, in inside the towel so I could go shake the, the towel outside. And I was shocked by the force of the, I could, that, that thing was so strong. <laughs> I mean, I could feel in my hand the strength of that creature. 
What yeah, kind they of are bees? super strong. It sounds like it could have been either a carpenter bee. Those are really big bees. We see nesting often in people's houses. That's why we call them carpenter bees. Or it could be a queen bumblebee, which we see out this time of year. And those are the really big bumblebees. But yeah, they're super powerful. They have tons of um, these really strong muscles to power their, their flight. Um, so in the thorax, that's um, how they're uh, so such powerful flyers for big bees. Um, but yeah, I think you're, you're braver than most to try to get one in a towel. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the thing is that you, you have to do what you, what you, what you need to do because I, I was not thinking the dog was going to enjoy, you know, getting one of those in the mouth. They Do they sting, the, the carpenters or the big bumblebees? Yeah, they do sting, but um, much more rarely than people realize. I think people are pretty fearful of bee stings, but um, they're pretty docile. Yeah, so, but but just just the, the, the I mean... I was amazed and then I thought, well, I'm going to uh, try to research to find out where those muscles are and what kind of muscles they are, because that that was I could I can feel it even right now just talking about that strength of that of that. And and is is that the one that um, people say about those bees? You know, they they're aerodynamically impossible to fly, but they do fly. Yeah, absolutely. It's because they um, have such huge bodies that they have to, you know, relative to their wing size that they have to lift. So it's it's this really impressive physical feat that they're able to do that. And they use those same muscles um, or certain bees use those same muscles to vibrate flowers and cause them to release pollen. Um, so they're also really important for pollination as well as for, for powering flight. I see that was another question I had is, is the relationship between the, the noise and the vibration and the pollination. So you've just answered that question. So that same strength, they can shake the, I mean, you could probably shake a little tree with that power. Yeah, exactly. So like carpenter bees, it sounds like you might've had a, a carpenter bee in your house. Um, they're known for this, this behavior we call buzz pollination, where they vibrate those flight muscles um, at a specific frequency that causes certain flowers to release pollen. So they have this um, really harmonious evolutionary relationship with these uh, flowers that they're specifically adapted to pollinate. So, um, and we depend on that buzz pollination for a lot of um, our favorite crops, like um, things like uh, tomato, eggplant, um, I think passion fruit, um, so mm -hmm. different pollinators have different behaviors and strategies for mm -hmm. pollinating flowers. And that's why it's really important to have a big diversity of pollinators. So we can, we can, um, access all these different, um, to pollinate all these different crops. So that's, that's so interesting. So they have developed a certain frequency that through evolution is answered by the flower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So a lot of flowers have um, really specific evolutionary relationships with certain pollinators, the way that they're shaped um, or yeah, the, the way that they release pollen, the way that they look. Um, and um, that allows them to have that, that special mutualistic relationship that ensures that the plant can reproduce and at the same time, the bee can reproduce and use that pollen to feed her offspring. So we, when we get back from the break, I would like to talk about the difference between maybe Elizabeth and Madeline can discuss this, the way that a monarch can see their eyes, for example, and the way that a bee can see and what they see. Are they similar? Are they different? I'd love to know about that. And it's interesting because, you know, Elizabeth's work is about seeing and, uh, you know, so that I, I want to kind of throw that bo both of you maybe talk about a little bit about that when we get back from the break. So uh, reintroducing, I'm talking with um, the California Nature Art Museum, specifically Stacy Adi is here, the director for 14 years. And she has curated a show at the museum called The Birds and the Bees and More Pollinators, featuring mixed media, original art, and a collaboration with the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration at UCSB. And we've got Madeline Ostwald, a postdoc 
um, student to talk a little bit about that collaboration as well. Um, so don't turn that down. I'd love to talk a little bit about how bees and monarchs actually see, how they see when we get back from the break. Don't turn that down. Back in a minute. All right, you are clear. Madeline, I'll leave that for you because I don't know. <laughs> <how monarchs see. laughs> I don't know a ton about monarch vision, but I can kind of speculate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I'm curious. <laughs> when when I was trying to catch catch that bee, um, it, could he? I still I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing. Could he, could he see me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I it's hard to say how they would see how you would look different to them versus through human eyes, but um, they can see you and I think they can smell you, but bees do have very good vision. They can smell, they can smell the dog too, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but wasn't afraid of the dog. No, I, I don't think the, the bee was afraid at all. Yeah, I think you were wise to try to get it out because I've seen dogs snatch up bees and it doesn't not not, not 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 yeah not nice not not yeah and then certain certain dogs are allergic i, I had the uh, his predecessor two-time predecessor because this is my third dachshund and i've owned dachshunds for over 35 years and uh they um the one was very allergic to bee to bee stings so i had to keep a vial of, of something that you know you could quickly yeah. give him a shot yeah drill or something yeah. Mm. yeah yeah um elizabeth i wanted to let you know that um we did add two other artists oh great to the show at the last minute and so uh, they're not in that any of that original press release that you would have gotten from Joni. okay tell me so we added Sarah Woodburn. Uh, we had a little extra wall space and she has woodblock prints of her garden that she created during COVID. Um, and they kind of illustrate just a nice uh, friendly pollinator kind of world. And then we uh, borrowed four lithographs that are antique from the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. And I definitely, you know, want to give them a shout out for okay, their generous Okay, we are coming love. back to do whatever okay. shouting needs to be done in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and Stacy just was letting me know during the break that that the the um, birds and the bees and more pollinators show that's up at the California Nature Art Museum includes the work of Sarah Woodburn, who has done woodblock prints of a of a of a favorable, beautiful pollinators garden, and then she also mentioned that um, Luke Swetland at the Santa Barbara Mu Natural History Museum lent um, the California Nature Art Museum some antique lithographs. Tell me what they are, Stacy. Yeah, we were so excited that they were able to do that since we had a little extra wall space during installation. So these are uh, four lithographs antique by John Gold, who is a British oh, yeah. ornithologist. And uh, one of his big famous things that he did was he was determined to depict all the hummingbird species he could possibly depict. Um, hummingbirds only are in the Americas, not on the British Isles or that part of the world. So he was relying on people sending him specimens uh, for most of his life. I think he ended up with something like 340 different of these images, a little bit in the style of Audubon, if you have that, you know, kind of image in your mind. Um, so we have four different of these and um, they're beautiful, but they're also quite old. So these were all created from like 1841 to 1860. Um, and we were able to quickly get them framed and hung up. And we're just really grateful to the Natural History Museum and the curator, Linda Miller, at the Maximus Gallery for sharing these with us. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, I, I'm familiar with Gould's work and, and uh, beautiful um, artists of, of birds and, and uh, botanicals as well. Yeah. I didn't know that he was British. That's interesting. So there was no hummingbirds in Britain. No, and I think he only found a live one later in his life when he traveled to America. 
So I thought cool that was kind of cool too. Mm-hmm. How cool is that? You know, Richard's giving us a sign. We got to go to quick break, but I want to just launch into a little discussion. So Elizabeth, how do monarch butterflies see? You know, I actually don't know. So I think I'll pass that um, on okay. to Madeline. I'm very Madeline, nervous, go ahead. though. Yeah, I, so I'm certainly not a, a butterfly expert, but I know they have a lot of similarities to um, the way that bees see. Um, so bees see somewhat similar to us. They can see color, so they can see color patterns on different flowers, but the range of colors that they see is slightly shifted from what we see. So for example, um, we can see the color red and uh, bees don't see that color. They just to them, a red flower looks completely black. Um, so for example, when I um, used to do some beekeeping for research, um, they would always tell us not to wear a red shirt because it it looks like uh, completely black to the bee and they might think you're a bear and they might feel threatened. So <laughs> bees can't see red, I'm not totally sure butterflies might be the same, but I know both bees and butterfly can see ultraviolet colors, which we humans can't see. Um, so they have this whole range of colors in nature that they can see that we can't. And it's really important because a lot of those colors are found on flowers. So if you look at the UV color patterns of a flower, you might see kind of like a, a bullseye shape. And that bullseye is meant to attract the pollinators to the center of the flower from a distance. I heard once that the sunflower, that uh, that that shape of, at the middle of the sunflower, if we were bees, that would it would be ultraviolet. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. Interesting. Well, Richard's getting aside. We have to go to quick break. Uh, reintroducing California Nature Art Museum, their show, The Birds and the Bees and More, Pollinators. And um, there's a, a number of, of artists that are hanging in the show. We have one with us today. Uh, Elizabeth is here talking about her photography of the monarch and how how important that is to raise awareness of the plight of the monarch down to 2000 only in in 2020 is coming up a little bit. Now we're at 220 some thousand in California, but that's still low. So uh, that the, the work is in, in aid of that awareness. Um, I also have with us Madeline Othball and Madeline is a postdoc uh, candidate a postdoctoral student at UCSB at the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration. Why she collaborated is because the entire um, Center for Biodiversity has been instrumental. For example, they had a show on March 3rd with music and microscopes, and they invited the public to come, and the graduate students brought their knowledge of the topic to the museum. How cool is that? So don't turn that down. Back in a minute. All right, you're clear. Madeline, how are things looking at North Campus open space? Lots of water, I assume, still. Oh, you know, I haven't been out there in ages, mm -hmm. or no. oh, at least a month. Um, and last time I went there was a good amount of water and I've heard good things, but I, I need to get out there. Me too. I need to drive down. I love it down there. It's great. Yeah, me too. What's happening? Hmm? Sorry? What's happening? You said something about water, Stacy. Oh, I was asking how the North Campus open space was doing. I assume there's still probably plenty of water down there. And I know the Cheadle Center folks are doing a lot with, you know, native plantings and they had that cool uh, burn that they did with the chew mash to try and, you know, regenerate and bring back even more native uh, plants through that and the pollinators that you're observing. It's just an incredible space. I heard about that. That's yeah. It, I didn't know it was the Cheadle that was involved. Were you involved, Madeline? Uh, no, I'm not involved in it personally, but I do go there a lot to look for bees. <laughs> <laughs> and Madeline, how many like, I, I still have missed this piece of information. How many like native bee species are there, say, in Santa Barbara County? Would... Uh, 150-ish, like quite a lot. Okay. Yeah. And um. 150, maybe up to 200. Um, 
Um, yeah, super great place to be if you like these really diverse bee population here. Yeah, the, the small specimens that we have in our show here, it just still blow me away. Like if I saw them out in nature, if, because they're so tiny, mm -hmm. I would never think that, oh, there goes a bee. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't, wouldn't do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. They look like flies, yeah. Yeah, or gnats. Some of them are yeah. almost that small. <laughs> I, I can remember Madeline at my son's little farm that he had that um, he would go and pick up like a square box. All right, we are coming back. Put it, it was in wonderful. Three, two, one, you're alive. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm celebrating a show that's happening at the California Nature Art Museum, formerly the Wilding Museum in Solvang bringing the important topics of topic of pollinators to the gallery in many different forms, art and uh, some hands-on experiences. And uh, Stacy, have you had many students come and visit? Uh, we have not yet, but yeah, we'll be promoting it to the schools and hoping um, they come out before summer vacation. And then we usually have some special student groups that come and cycle through during the summer. So we're excited to show it off to kids in particular. So the uh, area where we have the bee specimens and the bee photography, uh, which the Cheadle Center uh, helped us with, we actually have the little um, bee specimen in a little box right next to the big photo high resolution image of that bee, but we also have a little magnifying glass by each one. So we're really encouraging, and it's all ages that are doing it. I would do it if it were me coming as a visitor, you know, picking up the, the magnifying glass and looking at all the details in the actual specimens. Who supplied the specimens? The Cheadle Center did. I'm sure Madeline could speak to that, um, at which we organized through uh, Dr. Katja Seltman. Right. So at the Cheadle Center, we have a um, really a great regional um, insect collection or uh, invertebrate zoology collection. So this is a large collection of um, thousands of uh, pinned specimens, insect specimens, and with a big focus on bees, on our um, local native bees. And like I was just saying, we have around 150-ish species of bees in uh, Santa Barbara County. So um, the diversity is just um, astounding here. And it's um, something I think people don't realize that um, when you're looking around outside, you might recognize your bumblebees or your honeybees, but there's so many more um, really different kinds of bees out there that I think the exhibit really showcases. I have a dumb question. Do we have non-native bees in our area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so probably the bee that people see overwhelmingly the most when you go outside is the honeybee. And that's actually the European honeybee um, that was uh, imported to the Americas for honey production hundreds of years ago. Um, so even though honeybees are what we're most familiar with, um, they're actually non-native. Are they harmful to the native? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's something that is like currently being researched um, from a lot of different angles. There's a, a lot of suggestions that, um, so honeybees live in these big uh, colonies of thousands of individuals. They have these really powerful workforces that go out and take nectar and pollen from all the flowers. Um, so it's in some cases, it's really hard for native bees, which are often just solitary bees, to compete with those really powerful oh. pollinators. So um, they do provide some some competition to our native pollinators, which can be a bad thing. Um, and they also can um, carry and introduce diseases that our native pollinators are, are not adapted to handle. And yet there's just, they've become part of the ecosystem, I, I would suppose, so that, you know, basically there's no wiping them out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Richard, you're telling us we have to go to a quick break? Okay. When we get back from the break, I want to ask about the leaves pollinators that we haven't discussed, the birds and the bats. I wonder if Stacy could talk to us a little bit about birds and bats. I mean, I had no idea that bats were pollinators. Uh, so how interesting is that? Richard, let's go to quick break, and then Stacy's going to tell us a little bit about the 
there's four bees here, uh, bees, butterflies, birds, and bats. We've talked about the bees and the butterflies, but not the birds and the bats. So we'll talk about that when we get back to the break. Don't turn that down. Back in a minute with the California Nature Art Museum show, the birds and the bees and more pollinators up there in Solvang. Be back in a minute. So when when you were keeping bees, Madeline, did you keep honeybees? Yeah, um, and I kept them not, you know, not my personal bees, but I was part of a research lab that was studying honeybees. Oh, so this was this wasn't at your house, for example. It was a, a co yeah, yeah collective. at the university. Mm -hmm. Oh, at the university. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So your son does he have honeybees in um, Santa Barbara or? So so he so. So he moved from Durham where, you know, basically he could afford to have a, a, a property where he could do his bees, but he's in San Diego now. And there's, first of all, not, not all locations are bee friendly. Yeah. Which, yeah. So, you know, there, so that's, but, but he couldn't afford enough space to do that sort of thing I don't think you know because no. it, it requires it requires a certain area and also I think his his hive in Durham I mean they knew the neighborhood so well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and so basically um, and the neighbors understood that they were you know it's just not the same in more sophisticated areas right right quote unquote sophisticated yeah okay maybe. we are coming back in three two one you're live welcome back it's elizabeth Turpin, speaking with the california nature museum specifically director stacy adi who's been with the museum for over 14 years so uh, the birds and more pollinators and we have madeline oswald talking to us uh, she's a graduate student uh, working uh, on her PhD in at the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration at UCSB, collaborators with the museum on this show. And um, we we're talking a little bit about the uh, monarch butterflies with the nature photographer, Elizabeth Weber, who's still in the show. Stacy, talk to us a little bit about the bats and the birds represented in the show. Sure. So we wanted to make sure in the show that we were giving at least a little sense through the art of the incredible diversity of pollinators that are out there. Um, I've heard from some general, you know, folks that come through that, oh, they just think honeybees because we talk about them a lot and we all love honey. Um, and um, I learned early last year that, oh, well, bats, some of the bats can also be pollinators. And in California, uh, the pallid bat is a particular bat that's known for being able to do that and being very effective at it and in California. So we actually were starting to work with Susan McDonald, one of the artists um, who does just beautiful, beautiful, very realistic, but in kind of a fun, magical way, um, almost portraits really of uh, pollinators and plants. And so we asked if she would be interested in portraying a bat. And she was thrilled that I had asked such a thing, which a lot of people don't think of bats as potentially being pollinators. And so she did a beautiful painting that's featured in our show of a pallid bat. And then a few months ago, maybe three, four months ago, I found out that um, coincidentally, this California has named the pallid bat their state bat. So that was kind of a fun thing that happened. <laughs> Can you spell pallid? Pallid, kind of like pale. So P-A-L-L-I-D. Oh. And they are kind of on the more pale side. And apparently they, they tend to like the tall um, column-like cactuses and those flowers. And I guess they're very good. And I think someone had told me partly because they like smash their faces in when they go in to uh, feed on the on the pollen. 
and or nectar from the flowers. So that's kind of a fun thing to put out there for the community to, to know about. Um, some people have fears of bats. So if we can, you know, let them know that, Hey, look at the good that they're, you know, doing out in nature. I think that's a great thing. Um, and a lot of, lots of birds, I think are also pollinators. And of course, I think hummingbirds, which are probably most represented in the artwork that we have, um, are particularly maybe kind of obvious to some people since they, we see them hovering around all kinds of different flowers. And I guess some of those flowers are really adapted to hummingbirds as Madeline was saying, you know, a lot of plants and pollinators have evolved these crazy individual relationships of, you know, the anatomy of the flower and the relationship to particular pollinators that can access it maybe more successfully than others can. So hummingbirds are, uh, well represented through the John Gold lithographs that we have and also Sarah Woodburn's um, beautiful block prints of her garden often have hummingbirds uh, hidden in them as well and I think all of us in this part of California see a fair amount of hummingbirds. That's true and I just want to ask Madeline about your dissertation Madeline tell me about it. Yeah, so um, I, I finished my dissertation a couple of years ago at Arizona State University, and I was um, I was there, I was studying um, carpenter bees and their social behavior. Um, so a lot of carpenter bees have a really interesting social dynamic where some of them will live alone and some of them will live in groups. Um, so they provide this really cool opportunity for us to study, okay, what are the factors that cause animals to uh, cooperate and to form groups. Um, so that was my um, dissertation work. And then uh, right now I'm, I'm doing my postdoctoral work at uh, UC Santa Barbara, the Cheadle Center. Um, and they're focusing kind of more broadly on uh, a huge range of different bee species and trying to understand uh, how they're responding to some stressors in their environment, especially climate change. Uh, you know, my, my son Lockie was studying at um... Uh, the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Psychology. And uh, there was a, a professor there, I think Demazio, I think was his name. He wrote a book called How Why We Why 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 Cooperate or something like this. We, he studied primates. Oh, and, okay. uh, that was his field. My my son was there studying primates at the time. And oh. um, and this idea of cooperation, I can see him meddling to this day where he was in a hammock, a rope hammock over the the, the enclosure at the um, at the school, watching how bonobos uh, cooperated mm -hmm. for hours and hours. I got up there with him one time, and I actually wasn't supposed to, but I sang an opera aria to the to the primates. <laughs> I know. What did they think? I, oh, I, I think it's something from. Um, uh, what is it? The uh, some Puccini, I think I was singing Puccini. But anyway, I I digress. I just want to give another shout out to the show, California Nature Art Museum, the birds and the bees and more pollinators. We're talking there about fine art and other media and a collaboration with the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration at UCSB talking about important pollinators, native bees, butterflies, birds, and bats. And I assume uh, very quickly, Stacy, that we talk only about native pollinators? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I have to think about that. But yeah, I believe everything portrayed is, is native. And that's our point is like, let's look at the diversity of native pollinators and uh, knowing that honeybees are great and do a great job, but they're not native. <laughs> Interesting. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, Madeline, Stacy. Thanks for being with us. We'll come and see the Calvary Nature Art Museum show, Birds and the Bees and more pollinators. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you're clear. Fantastic. Buzz, buzz, buzz. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much for all of this. This is great. Yeah, thank you for being with me. And I'll send I'll send Joni the, the link. Bye, okay. guys. Okay. okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet you.